Hello, I'm Julia Verlaine from J.P. Morgan, and welcome to the first episode of our LIBOR transition series. From mortgages to bonds to car loans, the reference rate LIBOR has underpinned global lending for decades. It is also tied to nearly $190 trillion of U.S. interest rate derivatives. But in a landmark transition for global finance, LIBOR is set to be phased out by 2022, setting the stage for new benchmarks. Here in the United States, J.P. Morgan has been providing leadership to develop a market around a new dollar reference rate called the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, or SOFR. Deals using SOFR are already being done, but key challenges remain and there's much work ahead. Joining me to discuss this today is Sandy O'Connor, who has chaired the Alternative Reference Rates Committee virtually since its inception and has worked at J.P. Morgan for over 30 years. We are also very happy to welcome Nadine Bates, the Senior Vice President and Treasurer for mortgage finance firm Fannie Mae, which has issued $13 billion of debt linked to SOFR. In fact, Fannie pioneered the market's first ever SOFR securities. Nadine is responsible for the LIBOR transition at Fannie Mae and is a member of the reconstituted ARC 2.0. And last but not least, Ben Kinney, head of North America rate sales at J.P. Morgan, will be guiding our discussion today. Welcome, Ben, Nadine, and Sandy. Ben, I'll let you kick off the questions. Thanks, Julia. Sandy, you've been working on this question of LIBOR reform for many years now. To help us set the table for why we're here today, could you briefly outline the major problems with LIBOR in the past and what the driving forces were behind the need to transition away from the index? Sure. Thank you, Ben. Benchmark reform has been on the agenda at the international level since 2012, so quite some time. And the initial focus was very much about improving governance, strengthening processes around the rate production and submission. In fact, this included the addition of a supervisory oversight function by the Financial Conduct Authority, as well as a new benchmark administrator, and a single definition of LIBOR, and last but not least, a waterfall methodology approach for banks as they were preparing to submit their rates. So all of this improved governance and protocols were very important and critical to shoring up the LIBOR process itself. However, none of them can solve what is the fundamental issue of LIBOR, which is that the underlying market that LIBOR is seeking to measure is no longer adequately active. And to provide some perspective around that, Today, for U.S. dollar LIBOR in the three-month period, which is the most liquid out of any of the LIBORs, there are only, on average, seven transactions. And those seven transactions only are approximately about $500 million worth of notional trades. And if you can picture an enormous inverted triangle, these $500 million worth of transactions are being used as the reference for over $200 trillion of activity spanning floating rate notes, mortgage securities, and the derivatives markets. So as Vice Chair Quarles has already said, this very limited number of transactions means that panel banks that are submitting into the rates are very reliant and need to contribute their expert judgment so that a rate can be set. So the heavy reliance on judgment and bank models rather than transactions has made panel banks increasingly reluctant to continue their submission. And that has in fact made the benchmark unstable or less stable because it may not be durable over time. And what we need to consider is that if LIBOR is suddenly not available without any advanced preparation, think about the disruption that would occur in the marketplace, uncertainties around the large gross flows of payments and receipts tied to LIBOR. Think about the market disruption that could very well occur in the lending markets, whether business lending or consumer lending. And it is that significant financial stability risk that, in fact, was identified by the Financial Stability Board, the FSOC, and many other policymakers around the world. And that is what ultimately led to the establishment of these public, private, national working groups to identify alternative rates for LIBOR, and that could show the road or the path forward so the market could begin transitioning. And in the United States, that group is the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, also known as the ARC. Sandy and Edine, you are both members of ARC. Mm -hmm. The ARC has evolved a fair bit over the last few years. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what the committee started out looking at and what its original mission was and what it's evolved into and what the new mandate is and what the new membership looks like. 
So ARC 1.0 was very much about finding a risk-free or nearly risk-free rate as an alternative to LIBOR that could be used for derivatives for voluntary take-up. As simple as that. And in fact, the committee was structured in that construct. The official sector was the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve of New York, the CFTC, the U.S. Treasury, and the Office of Financial Research. The private sector component were all the 15 large global derivatives houses. Now, shortly thereafter, we expanded a little bit and brought in CCPs, because that's where standardized derivatives are cleared. And we also brought in ISDA, which is sort of the central of all of the contract work related to derivatives. So what was the mandate? Again, to create a rate that could be used as an alternative for derivatives. The second thing that we were asked to do was figure out a plan, an implementation approach that could facilitate take-up on a voluntary basis. And thirdly, we were asked to look at those derivative contracts and make them more robust to ensure that they would be resilient if the benchmark ever disappeared. Now, something important happened while the ARC was in flight, and which ultimately led to the ARC 2.0, which Nadine will talk about. And those were the remarks by Andrew Bailey, the CEO of the Financial Conduct Authority. Andrew Bailey stated over the course of the last few years that he had been compelling through his supervisory authority panel banks to continue with their submissions. He also said that over time, even if panel banks continue to submit after a 2021 deadline, then in fact, he may declare the rate not representative. So all of a sudden, what had been a voluntary possibility now became a likely outcome in which case we had a heck of a lot more work to do for a larger constituency because now it was no longer about derivatives, it was about cash as well. And herein is ARC 2.0. And so that's really important to set the foundation because that's when it really became real for the market that LIBOR could actually not exist past 2021. So some of the points that Sandy mentioned, these are real risks in having to address legacy contracts. When these contracts were originally written, people didn't anticipate that this index could ever possibly go away. So having a broader group of market participants come together and try to think through a lot of these complicated issues is incredibly important. I still get the sense that there's a very unlevel knowledge base in the market for sure around how the transition is going and what the plan is over the coming years. You mentioned SOFR a couple of times. I was wondering if you could walk us through how the ARC came to settle on SOFR as the recommended benchmark. So let's talk about the secured overnight financing rate, how we decided on that. In trying to solve for what would be a viable alternative, first and foremost, the ARC really focused on what would be a rate that actually mitigated the risks of what was wrong with LIBOR. And again, we talked about limited transactions, not a lot of volumes. So any rate that we were going to consider had to have a deep and liquid market. The second thing that we thought about is the ARC defined criteria, very specific criteria, that we wanted our rate to have because that would ensure durability over time. And we borrowed very heavily from the criteria outlined by the IOSCO principles for financial benchmarks. So that included things like deeply transactions-based, resilient to changes in regulation, resilient to extremes in the economic cycle, good governance, We also got very specific guidance from the Fed. The Fed encouraged us to avoid any rate choice that could potentially constrain their ability to make adjustments to the monetary policy framework. So as the ARC stepped back, we did consider rates like Fed Effective and OIS and T-bills and T-notes and T-bonds and repo financing. And the reality was none of them met the criteria that the ARC set. So in fact, the two finalist rates, the SOFR, Secured Overnight Financing Rate, and the OBFR, the Overnight Bank Funding Rate, were structured and created by the ARC. But before the ARC made any selection, we issued a public consultation to gain feedback. We hosted roundtables and had real discussions. And very importantly, and this is where Nadine came on to this first round, we created an advisory committee of end users comprised of buy-side firms to give us feedback on these two rates. And then ultimately, we collected all of that information, and the ARC itself basically took a vote. Just to give you some perspective, that SOFR rate, on average today, has a trillion dollars worth of transactions on which this benchmark is set. 
And it covers a broad constituency. It's not just about bank-to-bank transactions. It's about money funds and securities lenders and other investors and, of course, banks and broker-dealers making it, again, a substantially more robust rate. So that is how we thought about it. That is how we evaluated it. And as you may or may not be aware, April 3rd of 2018, the Fed began producing this rate for the public, and so it was born. Okay, this great new rate. Definitionally, how is it different from LIBOR? What does the underlying index look like, and how is it different from this index that we've been using for many, many years? This is a fully transaction-based benchmark in the market versus what LIBOR had evolved from from being basically expert judgment by panel banks, right? There were no underlying transactions in this benchmark. It has a robust underlying market of repo transactions that support it. It's overnight. It's nearly risk-free rate. It correlates closely with many other money market instruments. And from my perspective, it creates a more reliable, a more accurate and a more observable reference rate, which should give the market confidence. Mm -hmm. Given that, though, it's collateralized by treasuries, SOFR doesn't have the credit component Mm -hmm. that LIBOR did. But I think that's okay, because that's a difference that the market's just going to have to work through. From an end user's perspective, can you share your views on how SOFR is shaping the way you think about both issuance and derivatives? I realize it's very early days in the transition, but Fannie Mae has really been in the cutting edge of making sure that the market is thinking about SOFR in a constructive way. So from Fannie Mae's perspective, we were really trying to be creative and innovative with the index. What we did was shortly after it was announced, the reference rate was going to be published, we began to think about how we could use it. We waited until the Fed published the rate on April 3rd. And once we could actually look at it and compare it to other money market rates, we realized that what we could do is actually issue floating rate debt off this index. In July of 2018, we came to market with three different maturities that referenced the SOFA rate, a six-month maturity, a 12-month maturity, and an 18-month maturity. And it was brought with significant market demand. I mean, when we came into the market, we were expecting to issue maybe 500 to a billion across each maturity. And there was so much demand that we actually ended up issuing 6 billion in total. I think it's incredible the leadership that Fannie Mae showed. Doing that inaugural deal mattered so much because, you know, Ben, what we're trying to do is we're building a market. The rate never existed. It began being published. We're building out futures and derivatives, and you need to have natural demand. Absolutely. And and Fannie Mae out there with underlying debt demonstrating that it can be done and it can be bought and it can be risk managed really is opening up the path for the entire marketplace. And it sparked a number of issuers to follow suit quickly. Yes, absolutely. We've been impressed. I mean, over a short eight-month period, there's already been over 50 billion of issuance. Now, we've done 13 billion of that, but still, I mean, over 50 billion in eight months, I think, is pretty significant. And that is ahead of schedule from what we had expected, even as ARC 2.0, right? And it's showing that folks are getting more and more comfortable with the rate. The other thing I'd mention that maybe people don't know is that we didn't actually swap any of our floating rate debt back to LIBOR. And I think that's important to know. We're confident with the rate. Many issuers, and I don't think it's a bad thing if mm-hmm. people are issuing SOFR and swapping it back to LIBOR, but we were actually able to keep it outright, which I think is very important in the market. As far as the derivatives transactions, we've tried to continue to support the evolution of the SOFR derivative market. And J.P. Morgan was a part of it back in October when we issued a two-year benchmark, a fixed rate benchmark. Now, this isn't floating. We did swap a portion of it back using SOFR derivatives. J.P. Morgan helped us with that hedge. Now, we used other products as well. But I think we were the first issuer to actually use the SOFR derivatives as an actual hedge against debt instruments. And we've continued to do that. We had an issuance in January. January and one again in February. And people generally think there isn't liquidity in this market. The liquidity is building. And we were able to come back in the three-year sector and now the five-year sector to actually hedge a portion of this debt. So I think it's fairly significant. The other thing that I believe people know is that when you execute a swap transaction in the market, it gets recorded on the swap data repository. And this is really important and one of the key reasons why we actually use SOFR derivatives to hedge with, because it provides the market some transparency. Because prior to using the instrument to hedge with, people were kind of all over the place as far as the quotes that we got at Fannie Mae of where dealers saw mid-market. 
And so by actually executing some of these hedges against our fixed rate bullet debt, it provided the market with some transparency of where potentially the mid-market rate was in different maturities. And I would go on to say that over this period of time, we've actually found uses to be able to hedge from as short as six months out to five years. So the market liquidity still needs to build. But I would encourage all issuers to use the opportunity to kind of gain the experience. And that's one of the reasons we did it, as well as provide additional price transparency to the market. So things are happening. Trades are happening in the market. Issuance is happening. You guys have both used this phrase pace transition a number of times. Could you guys talk me through what you see the timeline for this transition to be? Is it going to be a cliff in 2021? Or are we going to have a lot more sort of mile markers along the way for us to pay attention to? I think if it's up to Nadine and to me, we don't want to see a cliff, right? (laughs) So the pace transition, just to describe why we call it that, in order to get the market to move to an alternative rate, again, given the fact that this rate is newly structured, you had to first see the rate. And secondly, the perspective of the committee was also, how can you expect the marketplace to migrate to this new rate until you have adequate depth in the derivatives market? So the launch of futures and swaps that Nadine was referencing, that was really important. And by the way, liquidity is in fact building there. I think cumulative volumes that we've seen since the launch of these futures contracts total around $3 trillion already. Now, the point here is when we think about progress against this, and Nadine has said it as well, the market is there. Participants need to begin engaging in it, and it is in everyone's best interest. In fact, it is in their own interest to build liquidity, again, in the futures and the derivatives markets as well. Why? Because the more we see there, the higher probability that we can construct a broader term curve that will have real value for the cash market participants. So that's really core components around the the PACE transition. At the end of 2016, we did an analysis of all of the exposures to LIBOR, U.S. dollar LIBOR in the market. And if people began using a new rate at that point and began updating their contracts at that point, 82% of all activity referencing LIBOR would have matured by the end of 2021. So the best way to manage the financial stability risk and the tail risk is to begin using this new rate now. And then, of course, focusing on how do you address the risks to make contracts more robust for anything that is residual. What should we be looking for to make sure that the market is actually, the transition's actually taking place from here? Well, I would say growing volume, growing open interest in futures and derivatives. We definitely are going to be looking to see when the CCPs actually move the price-aligned interest calculations and the discounting calculations from Fed effective to the new SOFA rate, because that will embed demand into the derivatives books for all derivatives that are clearing in a standardized way. We're watching for more issuance that is naturally linked to SOFA. And then ultimately seeing a term curve begin to emerge on an indicative basis so people can get familiar with what a term structure could look like. In fact, I would say right now and should have mentioned this already in the futures market, what does have us very enthusiastically optimistic is that we're seeing over 105 participants in the futures market, a broad span across segments. It's not just, again, dealer to dealer trading. And that means there's real interest, there's real activity going on. But at the end of the day, you have to have cash activity that drives demand for hedging for this really to become a longer term viable alternative. And the only other thing I'd mention is that even though this is an overnight rate, you can actually use it, as I mentioned earlier, for longer term transactions. I think market participants are expecting this concept of a term rate. The term rate right now, based on the pace transition plan, isn't expected to be out there until 2021. And guess Mm -hmm. what? That's just too late to wait for some of these things. So we've been trying to be creative on how do you take this overnight rate and use it for other types of maturities, because Mm -hmm. you can. And we proved it with some of the issuance that we've done, as well as how we've been able to utilize it in the derivatives market. So I would encourage people not to wait. Don't wait. Don't wait until you see a term rate because there's other things that you can be doing right now. I would agree with that. I think the term rate has a level of familiarity for sure. But I think there's got to be an assessment as everyone is looking at, do you really need a term rate or is it just familiar? Now, in some cases, that might be the case. And frankly, that's where it's in everyone's best interest to really begin transacting. Because if you start to build futures activity, we'll have the ability to at least create an indicative term rate. So Nadine, 
She told us what we have to do. When you tick through those eight or 10 things that have to happen over the next few years, what do you think are the hardest for the market to work through? What will be the most challenging? Maybe from Fannie Mae's perspective, as a derivatives user, as an issuer, as somebody who's heavily involved in the mortgage market. I think one of the things Sandy said earlier is incredibly important to stress again, which is the best way to mitigate risk is to start using SOFR-based products. You don't have to wait till there's a term rate. You can make incremental changes to your systems, to your models. And that's what I fear most. I fear that people are just waiting until there's this term rate or 100% clear path forward to start making changes. And unfortunately, that's just going to be too late. So I think one of the biggest hurdles that end users is simply getting started. I mean, this is complicated. You have to make it a priority at your firm. We've done a lot of work to try to think about what it takes to operationalize this internally, potential changes that we have to make to our models. Some of them we can't make yet, but we're spending the appropriate amount of time to try to think it through, knowing that as we get incremental pieces of information, we'll continue to make changes. The other thing that was mentioned earlier is around the contract language. Every time that the ARC is putting out information, we're taking a look at it and figuring out, is there something we can change to our forward-looking contracts or disclosures to make them more robust? So we're not waiting for the perfect solution. We're incrementally making changes as more information comes into the market. So I would really encourage end users to be paying attention, to start making those changes. Even if they're small changes today, it will pay off as we move forward into 2020 and 2021. And I think myth-busting is what Nadine and I and other members of the ARC spend a decent amount of time doing. There's still not a full comprehension of what is the fundamental issue with LIBOR. Very frequently we're asked, well, can't you just fix it? And that's where we open this segment. Yes, there's improvements around governance, and yes, there is oversight, and yes, there are waterfalls, but we can't fix the underlying issue of there just aren't any depth of transactions. And that is the solution that SOFR actually offers. At the end of the day, the important work that ISDA has been doing around contract robustness for derivatives, getting that finalized, the protocol, the waterfall, the fallback waterfall, the triggers, and ultimately what the spread calculation is to minimize value transfer to the extent possible between moving from LIBOR to SOFR, those are critically important. And I know we've sort of touched a little bit on fallback language, and I don't want to get highly technical here, but the reality is in the derivatives market, we actually need this protocol and we need this framework because if LIBOR ceases, current language is not adequate to avoid financial stability risk. This notion of value transfer in this transition, I think, is something that people are very focused on and trying to unpack in their minds right now. Obviously, the ARC is doing a lot of work to try to minimize that, which I think is fantastic. One last question, and I'll open this one up for both of you. Our institutions, Fannie Mae and J.P. Morgan, are fairly far along the path of thinking about a world without LIBOR and the transition to the new reference rate. What would you recommend to somebody working at a firm that maybe isn't quite as far along that path? How would you get started? Where would you be spending your time beginning the process? And then maybe you can talk a little bit about how our two firms are organized around this process and how that came to be. If you think about it, Fannie Mae, LIBOR impacts the majority of the products that we issue, that we securitize. So all the products, processes across the enterprise are really impacted. So the first step we took was really to think about and be able to identify enterprise-wide every place at the company that LIBOR touched something. So people process products, models, you name it. And so the good news is we've done a lot of that work. We've also identified all the contracts that we have that reference LIBOR, whether they're disclosures, pricing supplements, whatever. So we feel good about that. But again, what we're looking at is the contract language on a forward-looking basis. We recognize that the legacy contracts still, there's a lot of work that the ARC needs to still do on that. But as far as to the extent we could make improvements, we've added language into our disclosures that we feel makes them more robust. As far as kind of internally, um, we've worked closely, as I said, enterprise-wide. We've stood up an enterprise-wide council that I chair. We work closely with our regulator. And actually, to the extent it makes sense, we coordinate also with Freddie Mac, 
So it's important that the industry understands if there are things that the GSEs need to align on, that that we're actively in discussions about that. We've also obviously made changes to our booking and accounting systems to the extent they support derivatives because we've obviously issued those. The other thing we've done is we've reached out to third-party vendors. We rely on third-party vendors, and we need to make sure that they're paying the appropriate attention or trying to understand their preparation as we move forward. But as far as your question about where should people start, I think it's really understanding your exposures. Think about your cash products. Think about your derivatives products. Think about all your holdings, whether they're hedging or funding activities. Think about it broadly. Also look at your valuations, your risk management, your models. These are all things that most likely may need to change. Also, you need to obviously be aware of tax and accounting implications. Those are incredibly important, as well as regulatory and clearing requirements. You kind of have have to go broadly across the enterprise and engage with all your stakeholders internally. This takes an incredible amount of time. So hopefully people don't underestimate the amount of time that it really takes to be prepared. This is a massive transition for the market. So it's going to take a little bit of time. I think Nadine covered so much of it. A couple of things I would add. The ARC 1.0 and ARC 2.0, they've laid the groundwork. They've provided a rate They've launched a futures and derivatives market and have created a pace transition to really move. In addition to that, the ARC will be offering up in reasonably short order language that could be usable as appropriate fallbacks for new activity. And of course, we talked about ISDA and the development of protocols around that. So those are good frames because you're not starting from ground zero and you have to figure it out as an individual organization. At J.P. Morgan, we also have an enterprise-wide program, and that enterprise-wide program is chaired by two members of our operating committee. That's how high up this goes in our organization. And in fact, we've got a leader of this enterprise-wide program and many colleagues who are doing this work full-time as it touches products, as it touches wholesale activities, as it touches retail activities. So both of our organizations have gone with the enterprise-wide approach. I don't think that that's the only approach, but I do think people working full-time as their focus is really important here as we move forward. Great. Well, I want to thank you both for making it today. Nadine, thanks for coming up from Washington. Sandy, thanks for coming down a few blocks from our our offices. (laughs) It's great to have you both talking about this. You're both leaders in this process, and it is an incredibly important process for the market to be working through. I can tell you on our desk, we talk about this literally every single hour, every single day. It comes up at least once. Thank you very much, and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And that wraps up our first episode. Thank you, Nadine, Sandy, and Ben. We look forward to our next conversation. Tune in to our future episodes on benchmark reform. More to come. The views in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of J.P. Morgan Chase or its affiliates. This communication is provided for information purposes only. J.P. Morgan Chase or its affiliates, collectively J.P. Morgan, normally make a market and trade as principal in securities, other financial products, and other asset classes that may be discussed in this communication. For additional disclaimers and regulatory disclosures, and for further information about benchmark reform and the transition away from LIBOR, please consult the links in the description.